Good morning chaps, welcome along to the vlog. This, as you can see with this piece of paper, is going to be somewhat a little bit different to the usual vlogs today. And we'll just kind of slip it in to, uh, you know, to the workflow, to the vlogs on the channel and uh, we'll carry on obviously tomorrow with a normal video. But I wanted to touch on a subject which, uh, you know, caused a lot of controversy on YouTube when I put the video up. And this was the bottling video for the Plum Porter and we had several people comment on how I'd used the uh, the priming calculator on Brewer's Friend and they were saying that I'd inserted the incorrect temperature um, on the calculator which gives you the volumes of CO2 in the beer and then by taking that number like you put the temperature value in that the beer is at then from that number the calculator figures out how much CO2 will actually be in the beer now so you don't end up over carbonating because obviously the colder the beer the more CO2 will be in solution and uh, the less priming sugar you're going to require to get to the desired volumes of CO2 if you're following me and a lot of people stated on there that uh, you should be entering the temperature of the beer the highest temperature that it got to during fermentation. Now, for me, uh, this doesn't make sense because if you ferment a beer at 20 degrees centigrade, then the ability for that liquid to hold onto the gas in solution is a lot less. So if you've got a container of beer at 20 degrees C, then let's say for instance, that beer can only hold on to, at that temperature, at atmospheric pressure. This is not the correct figures, but let's say 1.2 volts of CO2. Right, that's at atmospheric, right, at, at a, what, 1 atm, 1 atmosphere, at 20 degrees C. So that's all you can hold, let's say 1.2 volumes of CO2. If you then decrease the temperature of that beer to, let's say, 10 degrees, then the capacity for the beer to retain uh, a gas actually increases. So if you decrease the temperature, you increase the amount of um, gas that the beer can hold on to, or the liquid can hold on to. And uh, this is something called Le Chetelier's principle. Yes, I'm looking at the computer screen for that one. So if we increase the temperature, then uh, we decrease the amount of CO2 it can hold. If we decrease the temperature, we increase the amount of CO2 it can hold. Therefore, if we decrease the temperature, then we will increase the amount of CO2 it can hold to let's say 1.8 volts of CO2. So you see where I'm going with this now. So if you've taken that 20 degree centigrade beer and you warmed it up, then that 1.2 volumes of CO2 would come down, the gas would escape from the beer. There is, of course, always another way to increase the amount of CO2 in a beer or a gas in a liquid at any temperature, and that is to have a pressurized system. So we've got our beer here at 20 degrees C, and it is uh, at one atmosphere, one atm, and of course we've got 1.2 volts of CO2. So what we're going to do now is we're going to increase the pressure. So we're going to turn the CO2 up to two atmospheres but we're not going to change the temperature. So by increasing the, uh, 
pressure in the system, we now increase, we force gas molecules down into the beer by increasing the pressure. And we'll perhaps, this isn't the correct figure, but we'll perhaps get 1.8 volts of CO2 that way. And likewise, if you then begin to cool the beer down, you will also be able to put more gas into solution because less of it is going to come out at equilibrium. And this is all explained by another law called Henry's Law. So, to give you a simple explanation, if you've got a surface of a liquid, like this here, then you have pressure pushing down from the atmosphere, like so, and you have the molecules of CO2 within the beer itself and the speed that these molecules are moving around at is dependent on the temperature. So the higher the temperature, the faster these CO2 molecules are going to move around at, which means that they can break free and escape and at the same time you've got a certain amount of CO2 going into solution from the space above. Not just CO2, all gases if this was open to an air environment but we're talking about CO2 over beer. So the fact that we've got the CO2 molecules actually escaping the beer and we've got CO2 molecules coming into the beer and it's dependent on temperature then this system at some point will reach an equilibrium where the amount of escaping CO2 molecules is going to be equal to the amount of absorbed CO2 molecules. But if we reduce the temperature, decrease the degree C, then what will happen is the speed that these molecules are moving around at now is going to decrease as well. They've got less energy, they can't move as fast. So you're going to have less molecules escaping the surface of the liquid. And then, therefore, the amount of molecules going into the liquid from the surrounding atmosphere will increase until this system at this temperature now reaches an equilibrium state. This equilibrium state, because it's colder, we've got a 10 degrees C here and a 20 degrees C here, because this is colder it will have more CO2. So hotter, less gas, warm, uh, colder, more gas. Right, so we've figured that out. That's, it's a given. Henry's law and Le Chatelier's principle. They're the two laws that we're using here. Physics, science, great stuff. So now let's move to the, uh, the idea of the beer again. So I brewed a plum porter and it was sat in a bucket like so and indeed we uh, had a lid on it but it was only a loose fitting lid yeah and the beer had quite a lot of headspace in there maybe a third maybe a third of what was in the bucket and this plum porter fermented at 18.5 degrees maybe even 20 but let's say 18.5 degrees C fermentation at one atmosphere. Okay, so when this has finished its fermentation, we're going to say uh, 18.5 degrees, it had uh, 
well let's just say actually for simplification's sake it's not going to be that high let's put, say um, 0 0.4 volts of CO2 was in that beer after fermentation and then what we went and did is we cooled the beer down to 4 degrees so I think it was 4 degrees something similar to that so all of this headspace here has CO2 in it now even though the CO2 can and will diffuse out of the side of the tub and away uh, CO2 is heavier than the air around us so unless there's an active draft the amount of diffusion through this here within a given time scale is going to be pretty slow because the lid was relatively tight fitting if we took the lid off and blew into the bucket we could possibly blow all that CO2 away but because it's uh, a relatively closed system we're going to say that this is a given and the CO2 remained in the headspace above that bucket and uh, then we chilled the whole thing down so as we chilled it down to four degrees now what's happened is all of the CO2 in the headspace is going to want to go into this beer to achieve equilibrium so what's going to happen is we're going to see an increase from 0 0.4 up to let's say 0 0.6 volts of CO2 so that in a nutshell is why I used four degrees in the priming calculator so we've uh, we've managed to figure that out I'm hope you I hope you're following me here I think it was going from first principles pretty simple now one could argue that yeah what about when all that CO2 goes into the beer it's going to create a vacuum above so therefore the pressure will be lower well no because that lid was not tightly fitted it would allow the gas to escape if during fermentation the pressure increased and likewise if this gas the CO2 is absorbed into the beer it can draw in uh, more gas from the outside of the container um, another way of doing it would be to ferment under pressure a slight head pressure of like 0.2 psi or sorry 2 psi 0.2 atmospheres or something like that and then you'd make sure that you always had a CO2 blanket over there I wasn't too worried about it in this case and that's the same principle that we use when we're kegging the beer we go back to this page where indeed when we want to put gas into our keg beers we don't necessarily change the temperature of the beer but we take a reading of the temperature of the beer and we'll increase the pressure accordingly to achieve our desired volumes of CO2 that's how forced carbonation works and we're doing nothing different we're doing nothing different here we're just instead of changing the head pressure the temperature is changing the principle is the same the principle remains the same so that kind of covers one of the comments that we had on the channel saying that you would have to have a pressurized uni tank for instance in order for there to be more CO2 in solution that's not true you can just change the temperature of the beer that will get us there at the same rate now I want to come on to the second reason why I like to use the lower temperature in order to calculate the amount of priming sugar that I need the second reason is if we've got a beer at 20 degrees C and it says that we have 0 0.4 volts of CO2 and we want to get up to uh, 1.2 volts then we're going to need let's say for instance uh, 1 gram of dextrose per litre yeah 1 gram per litre so if I go ahead and I do that but in fact I've cold crashed the beer to 4 degrees C and in there we now have 0 0.7 volts of CO2 then if I put 1 grams per litre in there then we're going to see an increase of 0 0.8 volumes okay 
which is going to give us 1.5 volumes of CO2. And that means that will be 0 0.3 vols over, over our carbonated requirements. So by using the lower calculation of 0 at 4 degrees, meaning that we have 0 0.7 volts of CO2 in there, then the calculator to achieve 1.2 volumes of CO2 would throw out a lower, like 0 0.75 grams per litre. So, doing it this way protects me from overcarbonating the beer. On a beer such as a stout or a porter, that's really quite important because if you overcarbonate a stout or a porter, then there'll be more CO2 in solution, as we've already addressed, but that means that there will also be more carbonic acid in the solution, meaning that the flavour profile of the beer will change as well, which uh, can have a real impact on the beers. So before I go, I'm going to put this away. I hope I've been clear and I've explained everything to you uh, in a simple way. But I'm going to now show you uh, what I think qualifies me to be able to give you this information. And I'm not just reading it off a uh, computer screen. I am. I've got the, the facts and figures there, if you like, with Henry's Law and what have you. But um, I've done this now for uh, four or five years. And this is one of the reasons why I think I'm qualified in that respect to talk about um, putting beer in bottles and using this priming calculator, which I have used since day one on Brewer's Friend, which is a really good website, by the way. Okay, so these are just a few of the awards that I've picked up throughout my brewing career. And as you can see, this was a Seba Midlands Independent Award in 2016. This was for small pack standard bitters and pale ales, which was of course the vacant gesture. That was in bottle. Okay, we've got another one here. Uh, 2016, small pack premium strong beers, 8.9%, the 45th parallel. That was in bottle. Here's one that a lot of you may uh, recognise. This is a bronze award for the Coconut Shy PA. Yeah, the recipe that Tom and I put together. Again, um, specialty beers, but this was, this was in bottle. We didn't send a cask of it, this was in bottle. Here's another one, uh, a bronze. Again, small pack, strong bitters and pale ales for the IPA. Again, in bottle. Here's another one, silver, for the vacant gesture. Uh, overall champion, okay, we got overall champion for the small pack competition. So it was the best bottled beer at that event. What we got here? Another one from a year afterwards, 2017. This beer then, the, the Vacant Gesture went on to win a national award in 2017, beating the likes of Hawkshead. They were directly uh, in our category for a couple of their beers, and Thornbridge was in there as well as a finalist. If you search on my channel, you'll see there's a video on there, uh, something like We Did It Again Boys, I think it's called, where you see who I'm up against on the big screen, and there's a short clip of me going up to receive the award as well. And then if I just uh, scroll through this pile of frames at the side of me, because there are quite a few now, then this is really right at the start of my brewing career, 2015. Um, small pack beer competition. Jaded Pioneer, our pale ale at the time, won a silver. Uh, that was a cask award. Uh, here's another one, 2015 for the Vacant Gesture. Small pack beers. Uh, here's another one from 16, Bronze, Vacant Gesture. Uh, 
small pack beers. Here's another one. Oh, that's a cask award, actually. Well, that's it. And then this was also, uh, we won the, we were awarded the FSQ, the SEBA Food Safety and Quality Scheme Award. Well, we had to work for that, actually. But uh, yeah, there you go. So we've got kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten awards for the bottled beers. And, you know, without blowing too much smoke up my own arse, which I'd like to do, um, this system that I'm using is tried and it is tested and it has been reviewed by peers and in fact it's it's been in competitions against my peers in the in the brewing world professional brewers and we've come out top trumps so uh, if you've got another method that works for you that's fine you go ahead and use that but this method adheres to the principles of Henry's law and the Shatley's principle sounds like William Shatley, doesn't it? And it also is backed up by uh, peer review, in the sense that it does work. That's that's my case, and I rest it, sir. That was a mic drop, by the way. Anyway, thanks for watching, folks. I hope that's cleared up everything for you on this subject. Um, all I'm trying to do is help other people make fantastic beer at home and by giving you this information hopefully that moves us one step closer towards everybody being able to achieve that. If you like this video give me a thumbs up, if you didn't give me a thumbs down, whatever you like. But if you do give me a thumbs down please leave a comment in the description below explaining why. I'd also love you to get involved in a bit of a conversation about this subject in the comments if you like and I'll monitor it closely and answer any questions that you've got there if I can. And also if you're new to the channel don't forget to hit that subscribe button and we'll see you on tomorrow's vlog folks. Thanks for watching.